Our speaker today is Gareth Morwood, who is our educational advisor here at Studio 3 and the developer of the laser approach. Gareth's going to be speaking for around 45 to 50 minutes tonight about what the saturation model is and how it can be applied in edu educational settings as a tool for skill improvement and systemic change. Okay, well, Gareth, I'll hand over to you this time. Hello, thank you very much. And, and thanks to uh, everybody for joining us this evening. Uh, and particularly, I think Steve sort of started off well there by uh, putting a little intro about himself and where he's from, uh, which, which I think is is sometimes quite a nice thing to do if you're able to do that. But obviously, there's no obligation. Um, I'll say what I intend to do is to um, go through a, a few slides in the first part of the, the, the session this evening, but also um, give you some opportunities to type a few things in or make a few notes yourself. Uh, as we go. Um, I think it's going to be quite straightforward, hopefully, um, and uh, hopefully useful for you as well. And at the end, I'm going to have an opportunity where we can discuss some of the things you've been considering as we go forward, um, uh, uh, as well as part of the session, if that's OK. So and it's great to see colleagues from all over the, the, the place, actually. Um, some people are online who I know very well, somebody online who I, who I think I worked with in the past as well. So hopefully uh, this makes sense uh, as we go forward. And, and obviously colleagues uh, from Canada as well, which is fantastic. Um, so I'm going to share the screen and if there's any problems at all, if people can uh, sort of let me know or type in the in the gap and, and Rachel will let me know somehow and we'll we'll see what we can do. I'm in an interesting sort of um, uh, position with the light in my sort of little home office come sauna here because uh, it's still twilight outside and when I put the main light on it's a bit bright so hopefully it works all right. Anyway, so the session I said this evening is about the use of the saturation model as a tool for improvement. Um, and, and I want to explain a little bit about the model then talk about the eight different sections. Uh, and I think what I want to try and achieve today is to show you that actually something that's pretty simple um, can sometimes be most effective. I think people, particularly with school improvement and looking to change cultures and systems and things, make things inherently complicated. And, and I very much have the view that, that simple things are the most effective and the more simple and the more um, easy to follow and understand things are, the more likely we're going to be able to maintain them. Uh, when we get tired and when we get stressed, it's highly likely that, that we're not going to be able to maintain complicated things in essence. So just to start us off, the, the, the saturation model and all the links are in here as well, by the way, and Rachel's going to kindly post them in the chat as well. Um, so you can have access to a wealth of information after the seminar as well. Um, the saturation model was something we um, published in 2011, but had been working on for four or five years prior to that. Uh, with colleagues, uh, Professor Neil Humphreys and Dr. Wendy Symes at the University of Manchester. And in essence, this was a way that we developed for including and working with autistic learners in a mainstream setting. So the learners we developed this approach around were autistic learners aged 11 to 16, all of whom were either not attending school or were unable to attend school or had been excluded from other settings, in essence, before they came to us. Uh, and, and some of those settings at the time were very expensive um, specialist settings. So um, it's not like, um, you know, we had a lot of money or we were a, a specialist setting ourselves. We were a mainstream school with 1,300 children aged 11 to 16, but developed a way of working as part of the whole school culture, the whole school system that was a focus on our autistic learners. And actually that benefited everybody. So I think two things just to start with. Um, although this was developed around including autistic learners within the mainstream school, um, the key focus that I always come back to with this is that actually good strategies for young people with additional needs are good strategies for everybody. And actually this since then has been used many times by myself and other colleagues as a tool for school improvement on a whole scale, including uh, schools in South America, in uh, Scandinavia, um, uh, most recently in uh, Norway and Gibraltar as well, where I've been working. So again, I think there's quite a lot of utility within this, and it's quite a simple model uh, for you to sort of hang various key elements on. Just before we look specifically at the different elements, um, during the period that we were implementing and working on this model in school, 
every single child that came to us went on to education, employment and training. So if we were defining success as far as our inclusion of these young people in our school setting, every child had a pass pathway into adulthood. And I think, again, sometimes a barrier to improvement and um, gaining uh, success for young people is people thinking success in a very narrow way is just academic attainment, for example. We were very clear what our definition of success was, was giving people those opportunities um, to find a pathway into further education, into employment straight from school or supportive learning or what, whatever was appropriate for them at that time. So we'll, we'll develop that as we, we go through the session. OK, so on, on here, and I think Rachel's going to hopefully kind of uh, just put these little links in. There, there's a, a greater detail about the saturation model in the first link. There's a couple of short films that explain it. There's a recent blog that we um, published recent, uh, just a couple of months ago in the lead up to this webinar looking specifically at the saturation model and low arousal uh, approaches for schools. And then the original paper is the last link with the um, main reference there at the bottom. Um, so as I say, you'll get the slides and everything anyway with those links, but but sometimes I think it's useful just to have things in one place. Okay. So th this diagram illustrates, if you like, the different elements of uh, the saturation model and how those came together. And I think, um, we're going to go through each one in turn and then after each section, uh, I'd encourage you to either, if you're able to type a few things into the chat that, that uh, spring to mind, if you like, about those different topics, or maybe just have a note down or, or, or refer to things yourself and we can discuss those at the end. But I think the key about this really is that we're looking about um, making change over time based on the different areas we found were really, really important for the young people we were working with. And so the first part of this was this idea about the agent of change, okay? Now, the agent of change is very much somebody that can work directly with young people and families, but also influence policy and practice. So I think one of the things I see quite a lot in my work with different schools uh, across the globe is that sometimes you have some fantastic practitioners who are very empathetic, really understand uh, the young people and the families they're working with. But in that setting, there are some policies, some practices, some ways of working that sort of have unintended consequences, which make their job harder working with those young people. What we need to do is have the policies and, and the ways things work as a whole school to, to be focused around the individual young people we're working with, not make things more difficult. And, and I think sometimes this happens just because there isn't good communication between the people in these roles. And this just reminds me of something um, that I wrote about a, a long time ago now, 2009, about this idea of what this agent of change is. So this is a person, in essence, this was me in our, our sort of model, if that makes sense. This is the person who's able to be that lead professional, but also commission and broker and find resources and manage those partnerships, etc. cetera. Um, and so in my sort of crude way of thinking, I think it's, is entirely possible to have great practitioners and explain to people about policies and about systems and structures. I think it's pretty difficult sometimes if you've got somebody that doesn't understand young people and the challenges they face and the, the, the challenges families face, to, to get that knowledge if they've come through a very different route and just understand policies and systems and structures and things. So in essence, it's really important in my view that for this model to work, we've got to get the right people in the right places. And, and I think, again, this is sometimes in, in schools in the UK, for example, the SENCO, the Special Needs Coordinator, and Wales, the Additional Needs Coordinator. Different countries have different legislation and responsibilities for this. But in essence, we need somebody that is able to work directly with young people, is able to engage and effectively co-produce and work with families but also have influence within the school. And in some settings, that means you have to have a, a title to have influence, be deputy head or assistant head or whatever, uh, which I think, you know, is its own discussion point. But um, it's really important that the people that are able to work directly with the young people and understand the challenges that are being faced are also able to influence those strategic decisions. So at the end of each section, I've just put a few bullet points. So this slide reoccurs, if that makes sense. Just about thinking about your experiences and, you know, 
how easy is it is in your settings, if you like, to influence policy and practice from the role you have? Uh, is that something that's a really important discussion point for your head teacher, your principal, whoever's in charge, to try and uh, be able to influence the wider policies that sometimes uh, will have unintended consequences to make things more difficult. It's really important we discuss what works well. So, so far as our ability to commission and broker and find solutions and things, how do things work well within that? Uh, and what areas do we need to develop? Um, and I think it's really, really important with all these things, we have our own sort of personal action plan. So this is why this agent of change comes first within this diagram and, and is sort of central to all the other elements. Because actually, if you don't get the right person who is able to influence the right things in place first, we're always limiting the other effort, uh, other things that we're doing. So we're, we're, in essence, we're putting a ceiling on really the capabilities that we've got. So again, sometimes the biggest barrier to creating change is getting the person in the right role in the right place to be able to influence those wider um, policy decisions and systems of change. So hopefully that makes sense to people. Again, if you do have some thoughts, do just bung them in the chat and I'll pick up on these at the end. Um, if you want to write a few things down and then just put them in at the end, that's great. There's no obligation, but but I, th I think it's useful just to think about those different um, uh, roles within schools and, and how important that is. And, and I think, again, that sometimes the head teacher is this person who's the agent of change, the principal. But then sometimes they might feel they're a bit overwhelmed with everything. So it's about how these roles work for you. And the other thing I would really stress with this, although this model is something that, that we developed in a very specific setting, when I've used this with other schools and in other countries and, and in different uh, places, um, what's really, really important is that there is an understanding of the specific nature of the community those schools serve and the cultures within those uh, countries and the like. And so, so I'm always a, a big advocate for personalising these to, to the nature of the school community and the way things work. And actually, most recently doing quite a bit of work in Sweden and Norway, and again in Gibraltar, there's quite a lot of difference in the way schools run and, and the way young people engage in education. So we have to be mindful of that as we go forward. Um, OK, so let's just try and see why it won't click on to the next thing here. Just bear with me. Here we go. We're on, we're on, we're on. OK, so the next thing is this idea of the school environment. Now, the school environment for me is not just the physical sensory environment. We talked a lot in our development with, within this model about the social environment. OK, so how do we support every learner within the school? Um, at those unstructured times, at the times where there's all these complex unwritten rules and expectations and sometimes where young people will just receive uh, verbal instructions and have to process that and make a change or a decision. Uh, this also feeds into the communication environment and we were very clear that actually it's really important that all signage has words and symbols uh, and that we make sure communication is consistent and is straightforward. So we're not making decisions and changing things in the moment. If somebody is very stressed as an individual going to the lunch hall and we have a plan for how we support that young person with that and we've practiced it and we work through it and then suddenly they arrive a bit late because the lesson went over um, uh, the lesson before lunch and the teacher with all good intentions says oh don't worry about queuing today just come to the front Whereas we've practiced queuing and that's part of the routine, the verbal instruction just to change something in the moment can cause significant stress. So one of the things we did a lot of work around was this idea about communication, consistency, and therefore how we created the emotional environment as a calm, consistent way of working. So there's a couple of blogs I, I wrote on this, which is um, what I termed constant consistency, which is about creating simple routines that allow us to maintain them even when we're tired and a bit stressed, etc. To think really carefully about that emotional environment and emotional contagion and stress and how we create that calm, consistent approach. And part of that, of course, is the physical and sensory environment. Uh, and, and I think 
this to me is the, very much the next step. If we've got the right person in place, it's thinking, like we said at the top there, what's within our gift to change? Now, it's absolutely within our gift to say we will not have bells ringing in our school. We will just look at the time and allow people to naturally move around and transition without it being a massive stampede down the, down the corridor. And simple things can often have a massive impact uh, within the, these areas. So, again, if you do have some thoughts on that, I'd be really interested in, in, in what you're thinking within your setting or your environment. Um, so we will we'll collect all these notes together at the end as well. Uh, and just, again, thinking about your own experiences, thinking about what works well, thinking about areas that you could develop a bit better. And I think we were always thinking there's stuff we could do better as far as communicating, as far as creating uh, that consistent approach across a big setting. Um, and, and so the important thing for us with that was involving young people and their families in those discussions right from the start, properly co-producing those as part of the culture which we were working in, uh, which was really important. So the next uh, area that we looked at was flexible provision. And, and I think, again, that what we want to try and do insofar as this model and good school improvement for me is to bring structure to the unstructured, if you like, to bring that consistent approach and way of working to what is a very complex setting of a, a big school or an education environment, because there's lots of people in it who all come from different journeys and lots of young people who are all coming from different places and experiences as well. So I'm always interested when I talk with other schools and use this model about how things are structured throughout the day. You know, is there a block of learning, a little bit of a break and movement, a block of learning? Or is there a massive, intense bit of learning, then suddenly an explosion at break time and wonder why some of the young people are really struggling? So thinking about that flow throughout the day, the whole day, not just when people arrive at school, how we help families with the routines in the morning and the transitions from home to school. So again, you know, I, I'm really interested in what things you do in your setting, but we had a number of young people who came in and just had their own little area and their own routines that they um, sort of used and listened to music, played with Lego, did whatever was appropriate at that time when they arrived, just to help that transition into school. And the key for us was to put that in the plan in advance, and to allow that to work without forcing somebody because of Elgos or the time arrives or whatever it is, to say, right, you've got to get to mass now. Let's try and allow that young person to have confidence in what we're doing. So create flexibility within the structure to then allow them over time to be better at understanding themselves and to self-regulate as, as a result. And, you know, we, we back, you know, 15 years ago had a large number of young people on dual role uh, with ourselves and a specialist provision, which gave us flexibility. And actually, um, th there's no reason in any places that I visited around the globe that you cannot have created hybrid systems of education. Sometimes this is a good example where local authority or government policy and practice causes some challenges for example if you're on roll as the primary school here that the results of that child stand on the results of the league tables for that school etc etc but there are ways around all these things so again it's about thinking what's the purpose of so flexible provision isn't just allowing everybody to have a personalized timetable and do what they like it's about creating that personalized structure within a calm, consistent way of working. And it's about being solution focused and outcome driven. So, you know, if having that flexibility of a dual role placement allows us to be more flexible in the here and now, that then allows us to plan more locally around the young person rather than have to consistently go and ask or go through a bureaucratic process to, to, to get things, et cetera, et cetera. So when I think more about the need for flexible provision, I think this is very much thinking about flexibility within the constraints or within the, the systems or the countries you're working in. Uh, and most of the time uh, I visit other schools and we use this as a model to improve uh, things for learners. Um, I'm sort of having a conversation where people say, oh, no, we can't do that. And I say, well, why can't you do that? I, I, you know, we asked people if there's a possibility here and, and there, there really is often no firm reason why you can't be more flexible. It's a case of 
having confidence and freeing yourselves up to, to think more more laterally often. So again, I'm, I'm interested in those discussions when I talk to other schools. So again, thinking about your experiences, what does work well? Do uh, There was a school in um, Norway I, I was working with a, a few, couple of weeks ago, uh, where actually a, a young lad in PYP1 in IB school, um, I'd just done his sort of little literacy activity that for 15 minutes on the tablet, and then was going straight through there into a crash mat in the sports hall where he was doing uh, a more practical activity because of the focus that's just happened before. It was built around the routines currently. And then when he was ready, he just joined the rest of the class for the, for the whole class activity. So the way they built in that flexibility into his timetable was a structured way of working that was proactive to reduce the stress that the young lad was experiencing. I think it was a, a really neat little example uh, of how that sort of flexibility can be built in as a proactive way of working. The next thing is about direct support and intervention. And again, I think this comes up a lot in, in the work I do in, in different places around the globe. You know, we've got um, some places where there's a real culture of um, this is the level that, that you get in the class. And then anything that's more additional to that or specific to do with language or occupational therapy or processing or specific learning needs or anything like this is very much delivered by a separate intervention. What I like to talk about and, and encourage people to do is to try and raise that offer, what we call the universal offer in the class that everybody gets in a way that then means that what we do have as far as targeted intervention can be more specific and more effective. So two good examples of this, I think. There's um, a, a fantastic uh, occupational therapist called Kelly Marler that's done a few bits and bobs for us. Um, and she's written something called the Interceptive Curriculum. Uh, and the Interceptive Curriculum, in essence, is a series of 32 lessons that can just be taught to the whole class. Uh, and interception in, in my sort of crude way of talking about it is the link between the sort of physical symptoms of my stomach grumbling to my uh, response, my emotional response, say, oh, I need to have something to eat. Now, actually, no child is harmed by having sessions that help improve interceptive awareness, for example. So simply having that hack in school and each year group on, say, a Thursday afternoon, this year group do it on a Friday morning, the others do this or whatever. We simply raise that bar for everybody within the setting. Similarly, uh, there's a neat little pack that was developed uh, where I worked for 17 years that's called Motor Skills United. And I'll find the links to these later if we need to. It's called Motor Skills United. That's a series of fine and gross motor skill activities. And I think sometimes, again, we can build into the way we're working um, into our universal offer, something that helps everybody. Um, and that then allows us to be more targeted with the specialist support and interventions that we have. Um, so again, I think sometimes the culture in different places or the way that we work means that a lot of interventions are by taking a young person away from the classroom. What I'm trying to think about is saying, how do we increase access to those things as part of our curriculum offer so that when we do have some time from specialists to provide individual and targeted interventions that is is more finely tuned if you like uh, it is more specific and targeted um, and the, there's a lady in uh, the UK called Mary Myatt that has written quite a lot of books about curriculum and that uh, and her latest book which is called Send Her S-E-N-D-H-U-H, -H, is a series of um, essays and chapters and interviews with different people. And in essence, the, the, the interview I did for that book was very much about raising our curriculum offer so that actually what happens in the day-to-day -day classrooms, day in, day out, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, is more inclusive, which then allows us to target interventions more specifically. And the other balance of this, and again, this is where I'm keen for you, um, you know, when we think about sharing, discussing what works well, thinking about areas for development, there was a school I did a, a sort of review for a few years ago online in one of the lockdowns. And there was a young man who was aged, I think, eight at the time, who was having something like over a fortnight, 13 hours of intervention where he came away from his main lesson. Uh, and actually, when we tracked that through, it, it was ridiculous, really, in the fact that every day he was coming out of something to have an intervention where actually... I think he'd have been better placed in the class 
uh, with, with more targeted support within that setting. So again, I think a key element to what we did here was really focusing on that balance of support and interventions and how we create the most effective use of what resource we've got. So that's a really, really important question, I think, and, and thing to consider as we go forward. As we said before, policy and practice, really, really important. So, you know, policy and practice should support each other. You know, we, we should have things that have to react to poor provision, okay? So again, to give you some real life examples, there's a young man that used to come in a 14 year old lad used to come in at eight o'clock in the morning and just literally skip up and down the corridor for 20 minutes and then get on uh, with his day. And actually that provided a really, really positive and powerful um, support for him as an individual in the transition from home to school and preparation for the day. Now, technically speaking, you shouldn't have come into school till half eight. So actually letting him in at eight o'clock is against the policy. However, the way I would argue with this all the time, if people want to sort of try and highlight these as problems, is that you're not going to say to somebody, actually, you're not allowed to use your wheelchair today, so we're going to stop you using that. Or I'm going to take your hearing aid off you today, so you'll have to crack on. Yet sometimes we'll be saying, oh, no, you're not allowed in school before half eight. Whereas actually what we're doing there is taking away the the, the support that young person needs in, in to start their day. So it's not just about saying, oh, that's what we do and that'll suit everybody. It's about constantly revis revisiting and revising things and thinking about how we can create systems and structures that allow that flexibility within what we're talking about. Um, so again, we shouldn't have policy that's reacting to poor provision. It should be part of that discussion why the agent of change needs needs to be in there in essence, where we started off. So again, I'm interested as we go through the points and it's great to see so many things popping up in the chat um, to, to look at what things people have done in their own settings and what things may be on reflection as you just think about some of these discussions uh, this evening. You're thinking, oh, I wonder if we should have a look at that or we could do that. Because I think that, that I always uh, take the view that I'm very, very fortunate to go and see lots of different schools and settings in lots of different countries because I very firmly have the view. I don't think you go anywhere and don't learn something new. Uh, and sometimes there's some fantastic things people do. And sometimes there's some things I'm thinking, well, you know, I can see why people are doing that. Um, but I think, you know, the fact that that's been the system for 20 years, maybe we need to have a think about um, whether that's still appropriate for, for the children that are coming there now, if that makes sense. OK, so the, the next area, as I say, was training and development for staff. So, again, the discussion I often have with schools here is about how training and CPD and ongoing development looks for staff. So there's some schools that um, and some countries where the only training people get are full days that are spaced out four or five times a year. Or maybe they're in some European countries, there's like a week of training and planning before people start mid-August. Uh, and then very little opportunities apart from meetings, which are often about process rather than ongoing training. So one of the things I think, again, is worth thinking about is those sort of full training days have some purpose if they are backed up by ongoing discussions and development, I think. Uh, I think um, it's really important to think about how your settings engage in that professional, personal development as part of, of this model that we talked about. And so two things that, that come up a lot when, when I do this work with other schools, um, you know, we certainly moved away from line management, which was very much about ticking stuff off and compliance into a culture of supervision and coaching uh, and working with people and thinking about that. Uh, and one of the things I'm pretty keen on is if you have, uh, you know, after school on a Tuesday, every two weeks, a meeting for an hour, sometimes it's really useful, for example, to read a paper on masking or to read about Milton's double empathy problem and then allow people then to reflect on that for a couple of weeks, try things in their lessons and understand and then bring that back to a discussion about how things evolve as a school. So we look at something that has a good evidence base. We identify how we can implement that for a couple of weeks, or maybe if it's half a term for three or four weeks. And then as a group, we use the next meeting to evaluate the impact and to think about how we build that into our common structures. 
Now, if in using that sort of model of training and development, it is amazing how in a very short space of time, things can change. So one of the things I talk a lot about um, and, and a really fantastic discussion I had with some colleagues in a school in Sweden that I worked with uh, in August at the beginning of their year, we talked a lot about not using behaviour plans and forcing compliance, but using stress support plans. And I'll have some links uh, uh, it later in this uh, presentation about that. Um, where we look about the language of stress and coping and we build those conversations around solution focused approaches. And uh, this colleague who leads up the, the sort of guidance and welfare team in this school in Sweden was explaining to me about how they've developed that within their team and how the culture has changed massively from August until now in January. And part of the work I'm going to be doing over the next few terms is just having some online discussions to help facilitate how they build those systems in to long-term provision and, and policy and practice. And just the initial discussion I had about that, those meetings coming ahead with, with a colleague in, in Sweden last week was so powerful. I really hope that we'll be able to host a webinar where she is able to explain their journey, what they've done, and we can actually share some of those outcomes because that is a real good example, I think, of where somebody's taken an idea that I have felt works and has good utility across many different settings. And they've really personalized that for their place, their children, their community. Um, so, again, I'm interested in as we reflect, share experience, think about what works well. How do people access professional development and ongoing training? Uh, in your settings and actually you know are we still doing things that we've always done where people just have five full days and and um, you know that's that's the offer in essence and all the other meetings are about compliance and ticking stuff off now actually uh, I would suggest that I think that's probably less effective than a regular and um, ongoing way of implementing things and then embedding them into practice. So again, uh, I, I think different countries and different settings do things differently, but it's an important point to consider. Um, the other thing that, that we found was essential really was this idea about peer education and awareness. So, you know, I, I say quite often really, I've never seen uh, a young person tip another ch a child out of a wheelchair in a setting or rip a bone anchored hearing aid out of somebody's head. I have seen people sit next to an autistic young person, for example, and be tapping a pen or doing something that eventually becomes too much for, for that individual. Uh, and young people do test those boundaries. And I think one thing that we did a lot of work with um, I, and a draw um, again here on, on the story of Bobby's story, which is uh, who is uh, one of autistic twins whose mother, Debbie Ellie, and I uh, wrote a book recently, which I'll just highlight at the end. But uh, Bobby developed this way of working where he wrote a little script about himself before he came to us. And we just then decided, well, that's a good idea. I think everybody should write their little script about themselves. What do people want to know about them? Now, what's really important about your script and how you think about this in your setting is, you know, some young people will be very comfortable be saying, I want you to know I'm autistic. OK, now some young people will not be comfortable with, with that being said, even though, uh, you know, that is the case. Or some young people actually might want to just describe some of the challenges or some of the things they're interested in. But the key for me, and this was really important, and I get asked this a lot when I work with different schools, about how to support young people re-engaging with education when they've not been successful in a previous setting or they've had a bad experience and therefore been unable to attend, etc., etc. The first thing we did is spend a lot of time uh, with the young people and their families agreeing the script you know what's the script about you how does it work and this was very much then something everybody in the school did and then part of pastoral teams you'd agreed the script with the young person and the families and either the young person would read it out to the peers or some another adult would read it out but we'd read out what was agreed in advance and, and what we found was that was a, a pretty crude but important mechanism for allowing people to be true about what what who the self is, who they are as an individual, if that makes sense. Um, and again, I think the more proficient we got in this, the, the better it was that before young people came to us, they were very much in the habit of being able to self-reflect. 
being able to think about themselves in relation to their experiences in school, at home, etc., uh, and, and how that sort of works. So again, I think there's quite a few things to consider there. Um, the other thing I think about with peer education and awareness is, you know, do we use positive role models, ex-students, young people who um, will relate to uh, as part of our curriculum and our content? Um, and a big shout out to, to an organisation called New Chapter Books, which you may or may not have heard of, who is a UK organisation run by a primary teacher, Ashley Booth, um, who've done all the work, really, in creating beautiful picture books uh, and class sets of, of things for primary settings, but, but also for, for other specialist areas, where um, they make sure there's a good, diverse range of characters, needs, uh, storylines, etc., etc. So the texts we can use as part of our curriculum, it's called New Chapter Books, the, the texts we can use in our curriculum offer builds in um, stories about people who are wheelchair users, people who are autistic, people who are black and from different ethnicities and, and different sexualities, etc. So actually, we allow the curriculum to support this view of what we might term a 21st century population, in essence. So again, just thinking about what works well in your school and areas for development, I think there's some things as far as the curriculum development and the materials we use that can be hugely powerful in that peer education and awareness section. Um, and, you know, the, the content that we teach uh, can be a really powerful vehicle for supporting a uh, wider understanding of diversity and, and inclusivity uh, within our settings. And, and the final part, which again, probably is obvious in a way, is being positive and creating a positive ethos. I think you can uh, tell pretty quickly when you go into a setting and start having conversation with people, if people are in a solution focused mindset or very much open to considering things, or if people are uh, sort of stu stuck in the rut, as it were, of um, finding a problem for every solution, as I sometimes put it, where, oh, we can't do that because, oh, no, we can't do that. And actually, a lot of these things are entirely possible if we choose to think that, that they're worthwhile. And it's really important, I think, you know, if we don't believe we can do this, so if this agent of change or the people that are, are trying to, to create the, the, the difference within our settings don't believe we can do that and work with young people, families and professionals in our setting to make that difference, who, who is that person that's going to do it? It comes right back to that agent of change and the starting point, you know, about the, the, the person who's able to do that directly, but also influence policy and practice. And, and this young lady, Elisa, who unfortunately is no longer with us, but... Um, uh, made a massive impact on um, uh, 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 young people and, and adults alike in her time with us. You know, I get things to do things my friends do, is just sometimes have things changed a bit so I can join in properly. Uh, and in essence, defines what in the UK we call the Equality Act, where there's a duty to provide reasonable adjustments to allow individuals to, to engage in, in what uh, everybody else is doing. Uh, and again, I think to, to have that as a mindset and to be positive in our thinking with regard to that uh, is really, really important, really important. So, again, thinking about um, positive opportunities and positive recording, and I'll talk a little bit more about that just before we, we look at some of the points that have been made. Uh, again, I think it's really easy in some settings to get sucked into quite a negative spiral or a very... Um, process driven way of working we've got to do that by next Tuesday that we lose sight of actually the individuals and the people people so again I think it's more important for me to see individuals and actual people than to see data points and uh, purely academic outcomes so how we define success as we said right at the start, allows us to look at things slightly differently as we go forward so in essence as I say that's just a whistle stop tour through the key elements. What I've done often is listed these as key areas uh, and then used those as part of the structure for regular meetings. So like every Tuesday uh, on a fortnightly basis throughout the year is an opportunity for people to do whole school development, personal training and and, and uh, uh, sort of, uh, you know, uh, staff improvement and, and school improvement work. And we build those key headings around the discussions that are happening. So rather than have very process driven things, we're constantly revisiting these things as we go throughout the year and then creating opportunities to try something for a few weeks, evaluate it and see how that fits in as the school evolves. 
Um, and, and key elements to this, I think, again, it's really, really important that we engage positively and proactively with parents and carers. Um, you know, this is, again, something that uh, I published with, with Professor Caroline Bond a long time ago now, almost uh, well, uh, 12 years ago, which was a very simple parental confidence measure um, where we literally just wanted to find out from parents and carers about things that they thought were good and worked well and things we could improve on. And, and, and we always had the view, really, that we could do things better. So, again, involving the discussions around families and really engaging with people is vital. And I talk a lot about that in, in as I say, in the book that I co-authored with Debbie um, about her view as a, a, a parent and carer and my view as a professional and how we uh, found that common ground, if you like. So, again, just have a think now and, and think about how you engage with families um, Co-production, as I say, is very much for me about engaging young people and families jointly in identifying challenges and then working together on finding solutions. And, and I would say, you know, although I would argue that we were reasonably focused in this area as part of the saturation model that we talked through, um, we always felt there was stuff we could do better, to be honest with you. Uh, and, and I think, again, things ebb and flow don't they they change as as, as the year progresses as as um, different situations happen so again we have to constantly revisit that's really important so this is bobby who i explained before when he was age 11 he's now 19 doing a, a computer gaming degree at manchester university would you believe but anyway and i think again this is like a completely unedited piece that that, that bobby uh did for us so school's good because they have many autistic students and understand us I think it's great because time at school, they know how to deal with me, support me, interesting turn of phrase. And I think, again, when we talked environmental issues and the, the social and emotional environment, social time is great to get to hang out with students who share my interests. And so one of the things we found was quite a neat thing was to ask young people as part of their script about interests they would enjoy and manga art and Pokemon and all these sort of things came up quite a lot 15 odd years ago. And then to build activities and clubs around those interests. So the shared interests create groups that support each other uh, as part of that peer education awareness model. So I think it's really important for me to look at things like that, not to say, oh, we've got to teach people how to engage with people. I, you know, I think it is a very medicalized way of looking at it. What we should be doing is creating opportunities for shared experiences that then allow those shared experiences to become part of um, their day and what they do. Uh, and certainly a, a couple of young people who um, were involved in activities like that in, in the school where I was at uh, have gone on with those young people who attended those clubs and activities to do things like Comic Con conventions independently and to be able to 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 follow up those interests uh, as adults as well. So again, I think it's about locating and, and focusing on the right area not trying to force some kind of compliance uh, which is really really important so i say we developed the, these ideas what we called student passports which in essence was a one-page document where the young person was central to it the language was very much about uh, stress and coping and being proactive in in, in working together uh, and in essence, these were our sort of stress support plans. So the links, I say, are all there in, in the, the slides when you get them. Uh, if you just uh, Google student passports, you, you'd find all sorts of examples. This has been, I think, singularly one of the most powerful things schools can use um, that make a, a, almost an immediate change, if that makes sense, to, to, to the approach. So rather than enforcing targets and systems and saying, you've got to do this, this is how we're going to implement this. It's about engaging young people and the families in that discussion around what's happening. So it's very much the process that's child centred. And certainly a, a school in Portugal I did a long piece of work with for whom the outcomes of this approach, when I first went there, I met with 25 parents and carers in one week, one after another. We talked through the passports, we explained to them about this very different approach. And then key staff in the school worked with the young people on these um, one page documents, which, which were the stress support plans. The language that was used was really powerful, you know, talking about the stresses, how we reduce them actively about what, what we're doing to help cope, help the young people cope and teaching those. Uh, and, and the culture changed massively within about six months. 
because actually we were approaching that then from working collaboratively rather than trying to force compliance a, a, as a result. And this comes through to, to say Damien's quote there, personalization, not normalization. You know, personalization is not just chaos and everybody doing anything. You create the structure to allow those personalized systems to have more impact. And as Rita says, we want to focus on harnessing strengths to allow everybody to be the best they can become and the best the young people could become when we develop this model and, and the work I've been fortunate to do it, applying it to different places globally is very much for me about giving every individual child choice post school giving them pathways into adulthood that have a range of different opportunities and choice. Uh, and again, I think that's really, really important as part of what we're talking about. And this comes right back to some of the stuff that, that I did when I was uh, studying for a master's degree in the late 1990s, you know, looking about disability equality and identifying barriers and developing solutions, you know, encouraging uh, things to change, evolve and let's work together and valuing the person as an individual, not that somebody's faulty and, and they don't fit, therefore can't be part of our community. And again, I think, you know, it's very simple, the, the, the model we developed, but I think gives us something to hang things on, if you like, and, and look a bit more strategically away from some of those sort of real um, heavy, sort of full on uh, hard work, school improvement tools and things, some of which are statutory in some countries. But a lot of it actually, I think, just boils down to, to pretty much common sense in a way. Uh, and we're talking about being positive, positive psychology, writing down three good things that have happened can be really important. It's really easy for some young people's experience of the day just to be negative. Um, it's entirely within our gift to focus on positive recording, to really highlight moments of happiness and to build those in um, to the relationships we have with the young people we support and to report those to families and to say to people about the positive things that are happening. To, as uh, our colleague and good friend Ellie Chappell says, to flip the narrative, not be looking at things people can't do, but to be very much focused on things people can do. Uh, and, and I think this fits so neatly within the saturation model. It's, it, it, it works beautifully together. Uh, so again, I think maybe just having those eight headings and those ideas allow us to look at improvement and outcomes in a different way. Uh, and this is about creating this happy school, celebrating those moments of happiness, considering those that have happened in your setting and, and what can we use to increase these opportunities. And I think a lot of the things we've just touched on today, I know there's quite a lot of uh, further reading if people are really interested to explore this within their setting. Um, you know, there are, will be great opportunities to increase these moments. Uh, and, and for me, that, that's got to be key. You know, I always used to say for the young people we work with when we develop this model, but also for any child in the school, if people can come to school happy and go home happy and go home, you know, not being so stressed and overwhelmed that they're having to mask and exhausted all the time, actually, then we can do a lot more other stuff. Um, I think when people are really struggling and are, it, overtly stressed and unable to cope is when people struggle to attend because it's too much to be able to manage um, using all your resources just to cope day by day. Um, so it's entirely within our gift, I think, as we look at this model to, to change that. And, and this is about personalization. You know, it, it's not about everybody doing what the heck they like. It's about identifying and locating where we need to support young people, having the flexibility uh, and making those adjustments. And as I said before, particularly in school settings, understanding how ongoing training, professional development, coaching and supervision fits into that model, not just forcing compliance and tick lists and moving through a, a prescription, but looking very much about how we work collaboratively to improve outcomes together. And, and that's how it sort of ties together in a way. So these are the, as I said, the eight different um, elements of this, which I, I will come back to right at the end. I just want to finish off a few slides now and then have a look at some of the chats and, and, and things like that. So I'll, I'll put this back up, up in a second. A couple of um, interesting little books. This was um, a book edited by David Bartram. And in this, I, I wrote about this idea of corporate responsibility. So actually, often the agent of change needs to be able to influence the policy and practice to create that identity where everybody's clear about what we're doing. We all have this sort of 
whole school approach and this view about how we're going to create this consistent way of working. Because if we have fragmented ways of working, then we have uh, issues which cause more stress. So it is possible, I think, to understand how we create that consistent approach. And again, it's it's quite it's a short little book that, but but quite a neat little one, I think, within that. Um, a couple of books that the the boss uh, Professor Andy McDonald has written. If you're in specialist settings where you're very much looking um, to use, say, uh, the saturation model as a way to move away from. Uh, previous ways of working there's a little code there gdm 15 that should work to, to give 15 percent off uh, but also if you look on the studio 3 website and there's some links in a bit about the laser approach which uh, is uh, part of the saturation model forms part of the laser approach it's very much about creating that systemic change within settings this is the book i wrote with debbie ellie um i say although it says uh, about secondary school basically there's a ton in there about working with uh, and collaboratively parents and carers and professionals and, and there's a whole chapter about the saturation uh, model in that um, all these links here are all the things that I've sort of mentioned and, and talked about here um, that uh, will basically um, uh, you know you, you can have a click on as you go through things as we move forward um i'm just gonna very quickly now and i'll come back to this at the end after i've had a look at some of the discussions and we can ask any questions as well uh we're putting together a series of education focused webinars of which this is the first uh the the, the two that uh are the next two that are coming up uh I'm, I'm really excited by so um tori nunn who's been a senko and a practitioner and now is working with lots of different settings and doing some additional research herself uh, on this idea of effective pro approaches to foster well-being as a whole school approach which fits so neatly within the stuff we've talked about today uh, and again with all these webinars when you sign up uh, if you can't watch at the time, you're able to watch on playback. And, and also, additionally, Shahana Knight, uh, who I met uh, for the first time in November last year uh, when she was chairing a conference I attended, do some fantastic stuff on embedding relational and connection policies as part of a whole school approach. So I think the next stage to some stuff we talked about today about saturation model is that idea about fostering well-being, positive recording, but also making sure our policies are about really how we can create that connection and that sense of belonging. And I think those two really neatly complement what, what we're talking about as we go forward uh, with that. And, and I'll just always finish with this slide, really, that, you know, I truly believe not a single child is born homophobic, racist, uh, disabled, or whatever external factors influence that. So it's within our gift, I think, to support those external factors in this approach and how we create our systems and structures to allow those young people uh, that we're working with today to become the inclusive adults of tomorrow. And I think that's so, so important. So I, I want to just at the moment, just bob out of this and have a little look at some of the points people have put in the chat. If there's some things that you would like to uh, fire in there now, please do. Um, those, as I say, are, are the list of things, um, the different areas and elements i i'm really interested in um you know your journey your communities and what you think are important and also you know we've got to be realistic about what the barriers are to be able to identify how we support uh and and, and create change so i'm going to just get in the chat now um and just have a little look hopefully so if you just bear with me and please do whiz stuff in uh, as we go forward. So I'm going right back to the start here with some great introductions. Thank you for that. Um, and we've got people from lots of different places, which is, is fantastic. Uh, so the first question there, do, do we think the agent of change needs to be the senior leadership team? Uh, often Senko's aren't. Uh, so it's, again, England-specific question. Uh, point, sorry, that Senko often is not part of the leadership team, therefore struggles to influence the policy and practice. So again, I think for me, it was very much not necessarily about a title or a position, but about that ability to influence. Now, if to be able to influence policy and practice, you have to be called deputy head and sit on the senior leadership team, well, so be it. But I still think actually it is possible to create that culture and allow that uh, influence as far as whole school policy and practice without necessarily having to have a title. Now, the problems I see around the, the globe are when people get that title to have that influence, 
then along with it comes lots of other jobs, which means they are less effective at the specific stuff that we want people to do. So we need to guard against giving people that position, but then along with it coming so much extra stuff that then it dilutes their ability to be effective. So again, lots of discussions I have with people, uh, particularly when I have the opportunity to talk uh, with, with people that uh, are able to influence government policy and ministers in, in different countries. But the reality is you need to find what allows that person to have the time and the skills to work directly with young people and families, but also to be trusted and be able to influence the policy and practice. Uh, and so there's quite a few pitfalls that, that can happen either way on that, which I, th I think is important. Uh, the next point here, is, as head, it's important that I am an agent of change, but that I can develop a team who can also be the agent of change with support from the team. 100%. I think that is so important. When we talk about corporate responsibility and this whole school approach, it's very much about how we create that culture, that ethos of people having confidence in what they're doing. So if we've got some practitioners who are doing a fantastic piece of work with a young person who's very distressed, what we don't need is somebody else coming along, getting involved and causing more distress and adding stress to that situation, for example. So I, th I think uh, that's a really excellent point there uh, about how you create that team as a head teacher. And again, depending upon your role, you're going to have different influence in this. Um, so again, this is the idea of um, how personalization fits within the model, really, really, really important. Uh, definitely think the Senko should be on the SLT, another point. And again, yes, uh, I, I, again, I can see see the point there. We, we sort of discussed that just earlier. Um, sadly, some heads are a bit distracted by other things um, to agree about a team approach. And again, this comes back to sometimes the head being that agent of change is not the best place because there's so many other pressures and things. I'm working with quite a few schools at the moment where head teachers of a school have suddenly become head teachers of three schools um, when other people have left suddenly just before the start of term, uh, often in international settings. And it's a very different model having that overarching view across different sites, particularly if some places, for example, in Norway, it's a good half hour drive between the different sites, for example. Uh, it's a very different model of working. So again, sometimes systems and circumstance mean something that worked well before is difficult to do now, if that makes sense. Um, oh, I'm just trying to get hold of the little button to drag the chat down and it's not letting me. Here we go. Oh, got it. <laughs> Uh, so being new to the school over the coming weeks and months, I'm getting to grips with things that are the agent of change, e.g. key com communication, curriculum, positive, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah, again, I think the way I've looked at um, the saturation model, uh, not only from how we originally developed it, but also applying it to other settings, I think just thinking about those different headings and thinking about how, that allows us to be strategic in the stuff that comes up day by day. And then things that happen, uh, for example, the, the few weeks before Christmas might be unique to that period of the year, allows us then to reflect and build in systems and change for, for, for uh, things going forward, which I think is really important. Um, next point here, I'm just going to try and whiz through them all, if that's OK. My 17 year old is in year 12. Uh, the Senko's fine strategies scaffolding that works, but the new Senko joined uh, and is wanting new ideas to put forward for my son to handwrite more rather than typing. So again, I think people that sort of say, well, you've got to improve your handwriting are locating the, the issue, uh, the challenge in the wrong place. So using that Motor Skills United to improve fine and gross motor skills could be appropriate. I think giving people opportunities to improve their typing skills and use technology can also be appropriate. And I think, again, it's about finding the most practical and pragmatic skill for the individual to develop or areas for the individual to develop that's right for, for, the, for them as an individual. So, again, I, there's a couple of things that I've just whizzed off there. If you can't find those, let me know and I'll, I'll find the links and things for you. Um, and there's somebody who's kindly aired something there about a book coming out from Routledge in the summer about aided language and AAC in the classroom. So, again, um, that sounds really interesting. So you can see that on the, the chat there. So, uh, again, like this holistic definition, especially um, linked to the senses, are schools fit for purpose? Uh, and again, I think I'm always pragmatic. 
you know, you go to some countries where there are, every school is a brand new school built around the needs of young people. And we go to some places where literally we're having to make do with very inadequate buildings and try and make reasonable adjustments. I think, again, you know, we've got to be pragmatic and understand, as I say all the time, what's within our gift, if that makes sense, to, to, to make a change. Um, you know, I, I, I'm sure we'd mostly love to redesign and develop our schools and how we structure things but it's not always possible to do that and on similar note i've seen some brand new schools that seem very poor as far as their their fitness for purpose even though they, they've just been built if that makes sense um and so, so th there's another point there about primary school in wigan that have worked hard on the low arousal calm environment uh so again that, that that's somewhere worth checking out uh, and I know there's there's colleagues from Denmark online and, and Canada who, again, uh, there are some fantastic examples, I think, where that culture has been part of that. Um, time, space and support, thinking about this a lot recently. I think, again, creating time and reducing the pressure of immediacy uh, and, and sort of the fastness of life can be hugely important particularly for adults working in a school setting uh i wish our local authority would consider flexible provision um i did a few years ago but it didn't happen i think again though there is opportunity for flexible provision within our, our own school setting so some schools that i've worked with for example might have somebody who um delivers forest school sessions as a full-time member of staff and then as the classes go to the forest school session, the teacher has time for their planning and preparation. Uh, and then that allows you, perhaps if there's a, a young person who say is 10, uh, to attend the forest school session with his group on a Tuesday, but then to also attend on a Thursday with the younger children as a leader or somebody that then is supporting and peer supporting the, the, the other children. I've seen that work very effectively in some schools in the UK. Um, certainly in Norway, the stuff they do, um, outdoor ed and, and, and things like this, is, is quite different as far as um, sort of the health and safety constraints of UK schools, let's put it this way, but some amazing stuff that, that can happen there. Uh, so the, the person we interception is Kelly Mara. I know uh, Rachel's kindly uh, answered that there, which is fantastic. Um, that chat starts. Uh, so I'm don't quite understand that maybe that's an answer to another question interceptive resource kelly marler's interceptive curriculum brilliant uh often a one-off event has very little impact yeah I, I i think again i think it determines a one-off training day or event can have impact if the school have capacity and systems to draw on some of those ideas moving forward i think the trouble is that that if the school or that setting or the culture is very much um highly pressured and people rushing for one thing to the next the next time people think about it is when they have a break or find the materials you know later on um so great so um thank you very much for everybody um making some points and things then um as i say you're going to get all the stuff i think somehow we'll work out how you do that and, and if you can't find things uh let us know as i say as far as a short session uh, session online a, a webinar it's it's not always so easy to to uh, discuss the nuances but one thing i would say is that the, the settings i've been really privileged to work with uh, over the last sort of uh, uh, 15 20 years or so just using those headings as a framework to help us collate a collective thought about what we're trying to achieve with young people um, can make a really positive difference. And, and, and I've been privileged to see that, uh, to continue to revisit and work with schools that, that are using that as a model. Um, and also I hope to be able to record and say some of these uh, fantastic things some people are doing uh, as a result of that. Um, so uh, as far as I've said, uh, that's the sort of end of the sort of formal bits. If there are any questions at all, I'm very happy to take those. Um, I realise that that um, you know January can be a tricky month and it's it's a very busy period of time. So please do um, uh, fire in uh, any questions and that. Oh, I can see somebody else that I I know there as well online. So it's lovely to see so many people joining um, who, who maybe have heard bits of this before but still think it's valuable. Um, so are, are there any further questions or anything anybody would like to say? Um, or, or I, I, are we sort of thinking that's come to a natural conclusion, as it were, um, as we go forward? 
Brilliant. I, I think we've probably, Rachel, come to it. We've saturated ourselves with uh, the information we obtain. I will just, I think, to uh, finish off, put up the um, the next few uh, couple of dates for you so you can see um, when those are and perhaps make a note of them. They'll be on the Studio 3 website, as I say, um, on the, um, the webinars tab. But, um, uh, you know, I, I really highly recommend those and the other ones we're going to line up as well. Um, which uh, basically we've tried to focus to complement what we've talked about in this first uh, of the education focus webinars, but also then to allow us to use the expertise of people who've um, developed different ways of working and have looked at things in different ways um, to try and help us understand what we're doing in, in, in different ways as well. Uh, so lovely to see people. Um, and please do uh, keep in touch with us if you think there's anything that um you know we mentioned that you can't find drop us a note or, or anything like that uh is uh, always try and, and and do the best we can to help where we can um is that okay rachel do you think there's anything else that i've missed there in trying to manipulate the chat uh, uh and everything uh I think you everything yeah great and fantastic so thank you very much everybody do as i say uh, keep in touch you will be able to watch that on a playback uh, and I say all the links and everything are in there. So uh, we'll make sure that, that people get the slides as well. Is that right, Rachel? Yeah, you should get an email in a few days reminding you that the recording's available. Perfect. Well, thank you very much, everybody. Have a, have a lovely evening or uh, have a lovely day if you're in a part of the country that's at a different time frame. Uh, and, and thanks very much for joining us uh, today for the webinar. Great. Thank you, Gareth. Goodbye, everyone.